play around with threats. We're going to look for something in a book called The Amateur's Mind. Turning Chess Misconceptions into Chess Mastery by International Master Jeremy Silverman. I do not particularly like to have music playing while I'm uh, doing a chess stream. <coughs> My setup is not uh, the way it should be. However, <coughs> I'm going to do the best I can to try to get everything on my computer screen. Um, so I loaded up an old database, I don't know, year 2000 or something. It's not current. It doesn't matter. Um, so my stream, openings my stream opening talks about Tactics, strategy, think like a master, that sort of thing. Um, beginning players are taught, okay, if I take this piece, he takes that piece, I take that piece, I win a piece. Um, while it's okay to learn that methodology that methodology will not get you thinking like a master it takes you longer to, to think that way than it would be if you just counted the number of pieces on a square or on another piece. <coughs> if the same number of pieces are guarding um, a pawn or a piece, then the exchange can't happen because you don't win. Now, huh. damn it. I don't play that much anymore, and uh, <coughs> I can't even remember the rule half the time myself. What I want to do Let me see if I can do this. There is a bunch of stuff here. So I have positions set up. Maybe I can do it this way and I will get onto my stream here. And I will see if I can add. Larger. 
this is really what I want to get into. Oh, I wonder if I can just minimize. Can I? I can't. Shit. All right, let me, I'm going to cancel out of this. Move this over here. No, I don't want moving. Uh, position set. All right. <coughs> Cancel. So the whole idea behind this. All right. Let's say that we'll put. Uh, let's say we'll put. Let's put a black pawn on the. Oops. I just clicked black pawn. I haven't done this for a long time. Let's grab a black knight and put it there. <laughs> a black bishop and put it there. Let's grab a white pawn and put it here. A white knight and a white bishop. Now, let's also say that the pawn can't move because it would put the king in check or something. Or we could say... Let's say that it's white's move. <coughs> hmm. And let's put a pawn here. Now, <coughs> at this point, You're asking yourself, as white, can I take that black pawn? So if I go knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, what does that leave me? What, where am I thinking, you know? Knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes. So in the end, black has a bishop on the board, and white has lost a bishop. <coughs> It's white's move. If you think in that term, it takes you longer to figure out whether or not you can win the piece. <laughs> if you look at it and say, I have two pieces attacking, black has the same number of pieces defending, then you cannot take the pawn or the piece because you will lose a pawn or a piece. Now, let's say it's white's move, and black cannot further defend that pawn. He's got to do he's got to do something else. Let's say that white moves the pawn from here up to here. <coughs> now, there's three attackers and two defenders. <laughs> um. As it happens, black would would have to take the pawn because otherwise, if he doesn't do so, he'll lose not only the pawn, but he will also lose the square. Now, that's more advanced because that's part of thinking like a master tactics, um, which I'm not getting into just yet. <laughs> I just want to get new players thinking so many pieces attacking a piece so many pieces defending and if the same if the number is the same then then can you put more pressure on that piece can you say put a queen on there or can you attack it with a pawn or let's say that pawn wasn't there um oops Let's say let's say we've got uh, let's say we've got a black pawn here. A knight, a 
bishop and then bishop let's say there and then there's a white pawn here um let's say that white can move his queen from say the e1 square up to the g3 square and he's now attacking it with three pieces whereas before if white was attacking with the pawn even though there's three pieces attacking that pawn black can get can get out of the situation by by taking the pawn because white's offered the exchange so why not take it if he's going to lose it then he might as well get something for that loss and then in the end there's still only two pieces defending there's still two pieces defending that square that the black pawn was on and two um, pieces for white that is attacking that square so white cannot take control of the square <laughs> If white were to, say, put a queen here, then now white can not only take the piece, take the pawn, but white gains control of the square with the queen ending up being the last piece on that square. Um, now you've got another situation where, let's say, you've got... Oops. <coughs> um, how do I get rid of that I can actually move can I move I can actually move that oh I can take it off the board okay let's say black has oh let's get rid of the queen Let's say now black's got two defending, white's two attacking. But now black is defending with a rook, which is considered a major piece. As material-wise, it's worth five points. And you know there's something else that I'm not able to do here. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Actually, no, it does matter. Wait just wait just a second. Bear with me because I want to try something here. Um, I just need to move this here and move this back up here. All right, let's do this again. All right, let's so let's say we've got we have a black pawn, black rook, black bishop. White knight, white bishop. So black's defending with two pieces, one of them which of which is a major piece, and and so on. So can white take the pawn now? If if it's white's move, and that's a nice try, but uh, I'm sorry you can do anything with uh, your language there. And um, it will not get posted because I'm just that good. <coughs> and I don't know if I can go over here and actually, I'm just going to, it doesn't matter anyway. Um, so let's say white takes with a knight, black takes back with a bishop, white takes with a bishop, and rook takes. Using that methodology, Black still wins peace. So again, two defending, two attacking. You cannot attack. If, let's say, uh, white has a queen. Now it's three attacking, two defending. So it doesn't matter. If it's a minor piece or a major piece, black is still going to lose that pawn. In the end, let's say that black can't do anything. So what we've talked about here is a tactic. We've, we've put pressure on a piece or a pawn in order we put more pieces on that because we want to take that pawn. That's a tactic. Well, actually, it's a tactic and a strategy. The strategy is 
Okay, the idea is that there's a pawn out here. Maybe we can take it if we pile up enough pieces on it. Maybe we can grab that pawn. That's the strategy. The tactics is how we do it. You set up your pieces, you know, and you set up your pieces however you can do it to attack that pawn. So now white has three pieces on the pawn. Let's say black can't do anything with the situation. He can't take with the pawn. He can't take anything. He can't do anything. So he makes some other obscure move that maybe it's a counterattack or something. You know, black could try to counterattack, like maybe attack another pawn somewhere with another rook or that sort of thing. That's, that's another strategy called counterattack. Let's just say hypothetically that black doesn't have any of those options. And white, it's white's move and goes ahead and let's say he takes the pawn with the bishop, let's say. Black's best alternative is not to capture the piece um, because if in thinking like a master, if you take all the pieces and the pawns off of the board, you are making the game simpler. And if the game is simpler for a white with one pawn, that one pawn could theoretically have a chance to go to the end of the board and become a queen. All things being equal, as they say. And my cable is uh, wanting to talk to me here. <coughs> so, <coughs> there, are there are things called strategies, which is like the overall picture of how do I accomplish a certain plan? Like, do I have a plan? Maybe my plan is to take a pawn. How do I get, the, how do I get my pieces to that pawn? So I developed the tactics to do that, to go after that pawn. Um, and a basic attack, uh, a tactic is simply just to attack the piece or the pawn. Just like I'm attacking my uh, snacks here. Let's say, uh, let's see. Let's put the bishop back here. Put the pawn here. Let's say there's a king there. And a black bishop here. <coughs> Let's take the queen off the board and look at the position again. So now we have two pieces attacking the pawn and two pieces defending the pawn. The question is now, because the knight is actually pinned, um, that's a check there on that diagonal with this, this black bishop aiming down at the king through the knight here. So does white really have two pieces attacking that pawn? Um, if you think like a master, the answer is no. There's only one piece attacking the pawn because the other the knight is pinned. If you think, well, m it's possible you could also think like a master and say to yourself, yes, I have two pieces attacking that pawn if... I can get my king out of the way. It's white's move. So in thinking in terms of the strategy and the goal, and you've, you've done all this work to accomplish one mission, and that's that mission is to set out to take that isolated pawn that's out there all by itself. So white just keeps going and moves his king, but it's black to move. <coughs> so theoretically, black could have another rook, and you could just put it in behind. And now, well, actually, no. Wait just a second. We don't even need that rook there. Black could just develop another piece or move another pawn someplace. 
because black is still adequately defending the pawn with two pieces. So now you could pile up more pieces on this pawn, let's say. Let's do a white rook here. Let's put another black rook here. Now it's getting a little bit more complicated. <coughs> and we'll leave the king where it is. Say it's white to move. Okay, so now if you think in terms of, okay, knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes, Queen takes, queen takes, rook takes, whatever, you know? Y you can see how this gets confusing. So now if you look at the number of defenders and the number of attackers, all of a sudden it becomes very clear very quickly. So you've got one, two, three, four defending, one, two, three attacking. Uh, actually, <coughs> you don't even need the rook. So then, so now you look at it. There's one, two, three, three defending, one, two, three attacking. So you know you're safe. Well, actually, no. There's four. There's a white rook over here. So we have to put the rook over back here. So again, you get two rooks, a bishop, and a queen. That's four pieces per uh, defending, and a knight and a bishop for white, and a rook and a queen attacking. So you get four pieces attacking, four pieces of defending. So you cannot attack the pawn. Um, now, what if, let's say, for example, what if, uh, let's see, what if, let's put this rook here, and we'll put a black king here, and a white bishop here. Let's say that we've got, uh, yeah, we've got something like that. So now you can see we've got another question. Do you have the same number of pieces defending as attacking? Can you win the pawn? Now if you look at this particular position, white cannot move the first rook, so that means white cannot defend with the first rook or the rook in behind. So it looks like black is only defending with two, pawn, two pieces. So it just seems to me that depending on, if you, depending on how you look at the board, if you look at the number of defenders and the number of attackers, you can tell a lot quicker whether or not you can take that pawn. So I know I can take the pawn now because I've got, one, two, three, four pieces attacking. Black only has two pieces defending because he can't move that rook. Um, <coughs> I don't even know why I managed to get into that particular discussion. Um, it's talking about defending and attacking a piece. So it's a tactic in um, this the the tactics are the attacking and defending and the strategy is can you take the pawn or not? So while you're thinking about it, you can grab your snacks behind the over the board chess game. And make all kinds of noise to distract your chess player. <coughs> or do weird things with your hair <coughs> to distract your over-the-board chess player. You can see the expressions on that person's face. Their body movements. Like are they twitching in the chair? Are they kind of thinking about, you know, are they mo scratching their eyes? Or are they moving a little bit more? Are they even sweating? Are they profusely sweating, <laughs> you know? Over-the-board chess players, some of them, are so into this game that they are literally out for blood. I mean, 
They want to wreck your day. Now, I used to play like that, but only from a defensive point of view. So, that's why I got out of chess, because... Number one, there are a lot of good chess players. Number two, there's like different plateaus of learning. Um, <coughs> you can learn the basics, and we're going to go over some of the basics and the tactics and the strategies. We're not going to go over that tonight. <laughs> Real easy to do. Um, then you get into parts of the game. You've got the end game, the middle game, and the opening. Opening leads to the middle game. Middle game leads to the end game. <coughs> A middle game would be most of your pieces and pawns are still on the board. They're, they're, they're moved in a certain position strategically to um, accomplish some kind of plan. <coughs> now, most chess players will play their game and they will not have a plan. then what they're doing is they're playing on their opponent's weakness. Now, this is a strategy. <coughs> um, if, you're, if your opponent makes a mistake and you see it, all of a sudden, when you started the game, you had no strategy, you had no plan but you recognize your opponent made a mistake. <coughs> and I'm not talking about a blunder here. I'm talking about something simple as moving a piece off of a guarded pawn or something like that. Um, nine times out of ten, the opponent loses a pawn. Uh, that's the majority of um, the middle level players. Uh, the beginning players will will flat out lose a piece. They'll blunder a piece on the board. They'll leave it hanging or, or it'll be pinned and they can't do anything. Um, <coughs> good chat... Good tactics and strategies will allow you to look at positions and say, like you can look at a position four or five moves ahead and say, okay, if this person does this, I can move these, I can move these pieces four or five moves ahead and guarantee that I'm going to have the position that I want when I get done and win the game. Now... <coughs> Um, grandmasters can think this way, and Bobby Fischer proved that that kind of thinking was not uh, the best way of, of becoming a grandmaster in chess. Well, it's not. No, I won't say it's not the best way. I'll say it's not the only way. <coughs> what he did was he came up with moves that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And in fact, they didn't make any sense. His moves were based on throwing your opponent off, making your opponent think of th that the, the person that you're playing has, has come up with some interesting plan. <laughs> My bird is jabbering. Sh shut up. <laughs> let's, say you're, let's say you move your, H, your out outside board pawn. And Bobby Fischer was known to do this. He would play an outside pawn up one or two squares. 
and his opponent his opponent would sit there for a half an hour trying to figure out why he did this. And in the end, <coughs> in the end, his opponent either won or lost, which doesn't really make much difference. What matters is that he made his opponent think about something for a half an hour. Um, because these are grandmasters playing each other. I think there was a Boris Spassky Fisher game. Um, anyway, so if you can make a move and your opponent doesn't quite understand why you made the move, your opponent may sit there for a good half an hour or more trying to figure out why you made that move. And that will throw his game off completely. And then four or five moves down the road, he'll make a mistake because he was thinking about what that other move was that you did that made no sense. <coughs> no, you could make a move like that if you thought you were losing the position in the game or something, if, let's say you had a certain plan and all of a sudden it's not going to work. So you throw some weird move out there that makes absolutely no sense and then hoping that your opponent will start to come up with a plan and then you will be able to see what your opponent's plan is because you don't have one. So what you're basically doing is you're trying to figure out what your opponent's plan is, if he has one. And nine times out of ten, better players are going to have some kind of a plan and you're not. Let me see if I can uh, elaborate on that a little more. Let's say it's white to move. And this is the end game. This is called the end game position. And in learning chess, there are some basic things that you need to know. Number one, you need to know how to checkmate your opponent's king. Number two, you need to know about stalemate. Um, you need to know basic things such as pins, forks, uh, skewers, and I'll show you, I'll go through some of that stuff. And anyway, so what's going on here? So what's going on is that White's plan and strategy is to move the pawn to the end of the board and get a queen and then eventually checkmate the king. Now, the tactics involved in doing that are necessary in order for the plan to work. If I just take my king and walk it down to the diagonal and try to move my pawn ahead, it's not going to work because the black king's just going to take the white pawn off the board. So that tactic's not going to work. I'm not going to talk about end game tactics. I'm going to just show you the idea of what a tactic is and basically kind of go over that in, in the the simple positions. So it's white to move <coughs> and what white does in this particular position is is do what's called opposing the opponent's king. And a way to do that is to have the white king directly across now, the king cannot move, the black king can't move into any square that's surrounded by the white king. That's an illegal move. 
So black has to either move to the right or to the left. It doesn't matter which position black moves to. Let's say that black moves here. Now, if white pushes the pawn, now black can come over and regain the opposition because then it's white's move and black could attempt to force a draw. So what white does is actually diagonally oppose. So white will move his king over here and now you've got these three, uh, these three boxes in front of the white king that the black king cannot touch. So the black king's going to try to crawl up the board and see if he can grab the pawn real quick. And as you see, he can't make progress because now the white square in front of the pawn is protected by the king and the black square in front of the pawn is protected by the pawn. <coughs> So there's no way that the black king can take the pawn. The white king, the white pawn, will eventually go to the end of the board and and get a queen. <coughs> so the tactic that was involved is called opposing uh, opposition. It's called direct opposition. Now you can also do what's called diagonal opposition, which is going here. Now you're diagonally, because you moved into that square, you have diagonally opposed your opponent's king. So even if the black king goes back, the white king can reoppose and then go back to that original square and win the game. Those are end game. Those are tactics for end game. Um, let's say that it's. Let's say that, okay, let's say that the king is here, let's say, and we'll say that the pawn is here. We'll say white has a rook, and let's say black has a rook, and let's say that the black king is here. Oops. So it's white's move. Now, white could attack on h5 and put the king in check, but there's a better move. The better move is what's called, I think it's called a skewer. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's what it's called. So white will move his rook over here, put the black king in check. When the check moves out of the way, the, the black rook that's in behind gets captured. I believe that's called the skewer. And there are endgame positions. There are rook endgame positions where white can force black into a certain position into certain positions where the black rook is one um i don't recall those positions it gets that gets more into the upper levels of gameplay and that's not what we're trying to accomplish here um let's say okay let's say we've got let's say we got a black king uh, a black knight And we'll just put the white king on the board. And let's say we've got a bishop here, let's say. And just for the sake of argument, say we'll say there's uh, pawns on either side of the whoops, board. <coughs> and it's white to move. So we're not going to look at... Well, we could we could look at something. We could look at something here. Let's say that white moves the bishop. Now, let's say that white has a plan to clear the pieces off the board so that white can advance his pawn to the end of the, the thing and win. Um, now, what you do, what you do is you imagine an imaginary set of squares where the king is located and where the advanced pawn is. So if the king, if the black king was in on this white square over here, I could grab this. If the black king was over here and the white pawn was here, let's see. So here, 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 and here. So Here's another tactic. So we were talking about defenders on a piece and attackers on a piece rather than 
saying to yourself, okay, if I take, he takes, I take, he takes, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't work. You don't want to think that way. You want to think like a master. Think defender, number of defenders, number of attackers. Here's a situation where you have to think number of moves. Now, instead of counting the moves, what you do is you learn patterns. You learn a pattern and say, if this pattern exists, can I win or, or not? So let's say hypothetically that, oh, actually, I could just even put another king on the board, and we'll put another pawn right here. And we're looking at this white pawn advancing, and the black king is here. It's white's turn to move. So if white moves the pawn, if white moves the pawn, and black moves the king, and white moves the pawn, gets a queen, and black takes the pawn. So, but you don't want to think like that. You want to think literally out of the box. Let's say if it's white to move, and if you look at this king, you'll see an imaginary set of squares. It's a three by three set of squares right here. If your opponent's king is inside that square, the pawn cannot advance to the end and win a queen. So I could take this king off the board, put this pawn here. No, I could put, uh, if I put the pawn here now, the king is not inside the square. It's called inside the square because this is a larger square. It's a three by three square. So let's say moves, moves, queen, now the queen is protecting all these squares and the king can't get over there. Um, let's put the pawn back here, let's say. So now if you count, okay, I move, he moves, I move, he moves, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, that's confusing. So what you want to think of is you want to look at the pattern and say, okay, the king is inside this box and the pawn is also inside this box. That means if the king is inside the box, he, in this case it's a 4x4, four four, and the pawn is already inside the 4x4 four four and makes a move, then the king can get over in time and prevent the pawn from queening. Let's see. And there you have it. Just like that. So let's say the black king was over here, and let's say the white pawn's here. Well, now you've got a problem because the knight's in the way. So is it going to work? So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. You don't know. If you count boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six. So here's the here's the square. Okay, you can see the square where the pawn is moving. The big square is right here, so that means the pawn can get to that uh, that square and win. <coughs> so that's a strategy. The tactic is, can I get to the end and win? The strategy is looking at this bigger picture and seeing this larger um, hidden invisible square. That is another tactic and strategy. So let's take this off. Um, let's put the king back here. Put this bishop here. All right, let's say it's white to move. And so now you know if white was to move that bishop, let's say white moves the bishop here, the king is definitely inside the square to catch the pawn. The white king is also inside the square. Um, there's a chance that you could have two queens at the same time, and one of the queens, one of the pawns can get a queen in check at the same time. Now, that's another complicated situation. It's a situation that, that you, you have to look at it when it happens in a game, 
um, we could, I could try to, I could try to simulate that. Let's say that, um, let's say that we've got a black pawn here, a white pawn here. Wait a minute. <coughs> Over here, let's say. Let's say that the white king, let's say that the kings are outside of the squares. Okay, so here's the square here, as you can see. Let's say that this king's over here. Let's say that this king is here. If it is... If it is black to move, Moves, 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 moves. If it's white to move, moves, 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 moves. So it doesn't it doesn't matter. So in this situation right here, if white even if black moves, either the king or the pawn, white wins. <coughs> because white can can queen and after the queen moves gets access to black's queening square so what is the tactics and what is the strategy the strategy is get to the end make a queen before your opponent the tactic is is it possible what what what's going to happen what's going to happen is that white even if it's black to move, white can still win because when when white, well, I'll just show you. Okay, so let's say pawn moves, pawn moves, pawn moves, pawn moves, pawn moves, pawn moves. Black gets a, a black king. White gets a white qu queen with check. So now the king has to move out of the way and then white will nab the black queen off the board and win. Now if white were to move the king, it's not go white okay, let's say where is the square? Um let's see here. If black moves the king, now the black king is inside the square, the white pawn will not queen. So white can also move his king inside the square. And now, so it moves See, it moves, 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 takes. So you can see that's the imaginary square is working for both of these, and it becomes, does it become a draw? Well, yeah, because the king is inside the square. So if, if let's say, the black king was over here and the white king's over here, so black moves inside the square, white moves inside the square, and now it's a draw, they just attack the pawns with each other's queen or king. So that's another tactic to say to try to draw the game instead of you would have to know, okay, can I get my pawn to the end of the board? The answer is no because I can move my king or either opponent can move their king inside the big square and now it's going to be a draw. <coughs> so if your opponent makes a mistake, if your opponent makes a mistake, let's say, and your king is here, you move here, and let's see, you move here, wait, yeah, you move here, and now you know that white only has three moves here, and black's got four, so as black, you already know you're not going to be able to queen, 
So you have to you have to maintain your position inside the big square. Moves, 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 queens, and takes. And now it's black to move. No wait, it's white to move. And now you can see the big square. White is now inside the big square. So the tactic is recognizing the large square. You, in order for black to win, that king, black has to move in such a way that the king can never get inside the big square in time. That's the whole, that's the whole tactic behind that. So that was so that's an idea of a tactic. <coughs> Another tactic is to pin a piece against the king, which I was showing earlier. So let's say it's white to move. And so white white uses a tactic called a pin and pins the knight against the king um, to either win the knight or to do whatever. Maybe add another rook, you know. Let's say the there's the, the they'll say that the black queen is on the board or something, and this does some move, and the and uh, that's not a rook. And then white moves the rook over. Okay, that's another tactic is doubling up on that piece. And let's say your opponent doesn't notice anything, so now white can take the knight. And black can't take it back because it only has the one defender. Oh, let's see. Let's talk about, for example, we're going to do, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a interesting position that I learned on my own. <coughs> Let's say that you've got some stuff going on on the board over here, and you know you got your king out. Like white's got his king, and and black's got a pawn or two, whatever, and he's doing some shit over here and whatever. Oops. Um. L let's say that you're trying to figure out this position on the right hand side of the board. Okay. Now, you don't really know what to do here yet because this is, let's just say that there's a, there's a, let's say that there's a position, there's a pattern, and there's a strategy, and there's a tactic. There's tactics involved to figure out who can win. We don't know what those tactics are because we haven't studied the, this part of the end game. So let's just say that black decides to move his pawns. Let's just say he start, starts to move his pawns up. So he moves that one. White moves this one. Black moves this one. White moves this one here. This is a this is a strategy that I learned to completely blockade Black's movements. Okay. Now you can use this to your advantage to gain moves. Um, it's it's much more advanced to be able to do what's called gaining a tempo or even half a move. Um, for example, let's say like white, if black does anything, he's going to lose a pawn or something. But if white can make a move to force black to make a move and lose something, that's to white's advantage. So by setting up this position for white on the king side of the board, you are locking, you are locking the position, and now black can make a move. And now you can make a move on on this side of the board on the on the king side, and you don't have to worry about anything that happens over here. And I'm going to prove it to you. So let's just say white moves that pawn. All right, so black's going to try a spearhead attack like this. And black, white just sits there, okay? 
So now black, uh, white takes the diagonal opposition to the king, let's say. And now black says, well, why didn't white do anything? Okay, so I'm going to take this pawn. And now white takes that pawn. And now look what you've got. You've got a blockade. So now, no matter what black does, uh, white white can triangulate his position such that when he goes back, he can go back and and gain the opposition. But what if black's got this move? Black still has a move up here. So instead of moving there, maybe white moves here. Now black could move here. Try to take that pawn. Shut up, damn bird. So now white can go here to gain the opposition. And black has to move back. Okay, maybe white can go here. I don't remember. I think if you look at this pattern here, after white moves this king here, there's like a 2 by 3 square, a 2 by 3 rectangle here. I think this is called, this is a certain type of um, opposition, but I don't remember. If you look at this now, if black moves there to try to oppose, then white can advance his king. And white also has a move back here. So he's got a move in, in you know, in the back. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I mean, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing this stuff out there because I don't know the whole the whole thing, even though he's taking the opposition, you know, uh, white can do this. Now, maybe the question would be, can black get down there and attack this pawn and get a queen before white can? So now you got to count moves. Or, you know, it's, it's really, this is, this is where the tactics get really complicated and you start counting moves and you're not thinking like a master because you're not thinking I've seen this pattern before and I know I can win it or you're not thinking about where is your king in relation to the square uh, there may be other patterns in here where you can count and then once you've counted that pattern you have recognized the pattern and you know you can win in a future game um, playing against me, this would be a typical, this might be a typical position, you know. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now here for white, it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now it depends on whose move it is. All right, um, let's see, white moved. So black can get a queen first. And as it happens, that the pawn, the, uh, the, wait just a minute now, to avoid that check, to avoid that check, White would have to play one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now white has a queen here and black has a queen here. So it's not quite that difficult to count. Um, that's pretty much what you have to do, and you gotta you gotta do this, you know, in a period of maybe five or ten minutes left in the game. Um, so then you're thinking, okay, I have the upper hand because I have the queen. And white's king is sitting on that white square right there. So what am I going to do? 
I have to try and skewer. I have to try and skewer um, the king and the queen if that's possible. Because if I don't, black's king is here and he will be outside of the box because you've got this pawn that can advance and get another queen. But this, if, if, if white, if black could trade queens or something, I have no idea. But anyway, I wanted to show you the blockade of the, the diagonal pawns for white. Um, this out of curiosity, let's see, it's Black's turn to move? <coughs> if, I mean, if it's White's turn to move, then White's gonna win, I think. It's, it's eight. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two... No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. One. Yeah, moves. Moves. Yeah. So if black moves, black gets black gets the queen with a move. If white moves, White gets the queen with the move. Uh, the black king is going to be either here or here. And you certainly don't want to be in check. So black, the black king would have to move here to the light square to avoid a, a check. And the white king would have to stay on this pawn to avoid a check here. Let's do it from Black's point of view. So we've got one, one, two, two, three, three, four. Wait a minute. Four, five. Five, six, six, seven, queen, queen, now I think in a position like this, I think white can win because now white has, um, let me. Yeah, white can white can win because <coughs> he's got the he's white will have the extra pawn, but it could be a draw. See now you have this position. There are I have some books. Okay, these books are literally an inch thick, and they talk about rook and pawn end games. They talk about queen and pawn end games. Bishop and pawn end games, knight and pawn end games. These books are literally an inch thick, and they teach you pattern recognition in going over literally hundreds of games. Um, nobody in their right mind has the time to go over that stuff. And you know, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I such a prodigy that? Playing this game literally is just going to take over my life, and this is the only, this is the only thing that I have to do. Maybe it is for some people. It certainly isn't for me. I play five-minute chess games, maybe mostly five-minute with no increment, 
and because I just want to play and learn my openings and and that sort of thing. I don't really care about the game that much anymore. But it can help you learn. It can help you with your memory, um, learning pattern recognition, say, oh, I remember something, and then you can win. Or I remember something and your opponent made a mistake. So now if, let's say if I were to want to skewer, I would want to have my queen as close to this king as possible to do the checks. Maybe that's a tactic. I don't know. But I'm thinking like a master here. Okay, I'm thinking like a master, even though I don't know the tactics. So I'm going to give it a try, and let's see what happens. So we're going to take the white king. We'll take the white queen. Let's move. Actually, we could move the white queen. If I moved it here, we can get we would get a block. Uh, we may not want that. It, let's see if we get a block, and then we exchange, and the black king is here. Then you got to ask yourself again: Can I get a queen first? So then it's one, two, three, four, five. So takes takes and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So yeah, black is not going to be able to get another queen on the board in time. So why uh, black cannot afford to exchange? White ha uh, black has to try and stalemate. Um, let's go here. So now where can black move? So now look at this. If black move, well, black could move. Now here's another thing. What if? Let's see. We've got here. Then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. So there might be a possibility of having the same situation again and, and giving it and causing a draw. <coughs> so you can't trade queens on that square. And if you can't make progress, it's a draw. If you move the king, black could attempt to force a draw by continuing checking, continuously checking. So, uh, so that would be what if black went here? It takes that would be one, two, three, four, five, and that would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Wait a minute. Takes one, two, three, four, five. Queen. Oh, look where the queen is on that long diagonal. So even if, oh wait, if the black king moved here, and then the black pawn queens. No, wait. It's it's here and then check and then here no over here and then white can keep checking but the pawn is sitting on that next to the last square ready to queen I don't know if there's a stalemate or if there's if there's a mate so what happens is the, the the opponent's queen actually acts like a king and opposes the king in order to get the to gain the opposition. That would actually be interesting to watch. That's another tactic is using your queen as a king to gain the opposition in order to win. Let's say, let's say, um, let's say the king moves here. White goes here, check. Here. Trades. Trades. Move. 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 Takes. Move. Oh, I 
guess white does get the queen first. Oh, but wait, we had that situation, didn't we? Now we've got check. Okay, so what we'll, what we'll do, what you do, you don't want to get next to the, you can't get next to the king. So you have to get, you have to do what's called like uh, creeping up towards the king. So if I can't go there, I could go, I could go here. I could probably do it here, check. And then just keep doing this back and forth. All right, this is a tactic. Now you're checking with opposition. Here. I think this is a draw. Wait. If white just brings the king down here, black keeps advancing until he gets a queen. And the king and queen just stick together like birds of a feather. But anyway, I mean, this is a whole nother topic of conversation. Queen, queen and pawn versus king and that sort of thing. Uh, so tactics involve... I mean, uh, strategies involve tactics. You know, you gotta, you got your, you get your opponent's king out there. You got a piece out there, and it's white's move. Like you pin the key, you pin the piece, or let's say the knight's back here all by itself, and you do a skewer, and you check, black king moves, and the black knight goes off the board. It's a skewer. Uh, over here, it's this. This would be a pin. So the tactic is to move into a position where you're creating some sort of an attack. That's that's a tactic. Um, let's see. So it's pins and skewers. There's some other things. There's some other types of tactics, like those pawn that pawn structure I showed you. That's a tactic. Oh, what else? Um, trying to think. I don't know. Oh yeah. Well, with a knight, there's there's also called forks, but I don't know. If, let's say the king is here, and let's say that the black rook is here, and the white bishop is um, let's say the white queen's on the board. And this could be other pieces on the board. The white queen goes here. Now, that's kind of weird, but I guess pieces can also fork other pieces. I believe this is a fork between the king and the rook. Normally, when you think of a fork, you think of a knight. And let's say white has a knight here. And it's white to move. White moves here, forking the rook and the knight. The rook is worth more than the knight, so that should be winning for black by winning a major piece over losing a minor one, which is another tactic. You always want to trade your minor pieces for rooks or the queen or whatever if you can do it. Uh, what else? Um, 
Okay, so <clears throat> now you can you can also do what's called uh, let's say that this knight was here and white had a bishop here and it was white to move. Now you can also do what's called a fork and a dis an undis uh, a discovered check. Okay, now the knight could move over here creating the discovered check with the bishop to the king, and the knight also attacks the rook. Now the king moves, or the rook can get in the way or whatever. Uh, the, either way, the rook's going to fall. Or you can do what's called a double check, where the knight moves. The knight also checks the king, leaving the, un the discovered check here. So you have... A double check. That's what I call a double check. Whenever you get into a double check, the king must move. And you can use that tactic as a strategy to try to mate your king. Um, let's say if, if uh, well, yeah, the king's got to move. Let's say if white had, uh, um, uh, let's see, white, if it, let's say if the king was, Let's see if the knight was there. And now we've got this. Wait, we've got this. So now we are we know the king has to move. So we don't think about attacking or defending. We we just know that two pieces causing a king to be in check forces the king to move. So the only square the king can safely move to in this position is right here. And let's see. Now, another strategy and tactic is to work with your queen and knight. The queen and knight work together very well. Um, it is a well-known strategy over hundreds and whatever years of playing chess that that type of position is in the best interest of of white to win. So we can actually, I'm actually seeing a mate here. So I don't know if you can see it, but there's a mate here. The queen, the queen is guarding the knight, <coughs> preventing the knight from being attacked. And... There's no safe squares for the king to move. Well, actually, yeah, there isn't because that white square on the end is double attacked. So if white moves the bishop here, there's a check. White can't take. Uh, he can't go there because of the knight and can't go there because of the queen, so that's a checkmate. Um... So it is a good strategy to try to come up with positions where the queen and knight are working together to create a checkmate. Not necessarily win a piece. Um, I've never seen many queen-knight tactics that won pieces. I've only seen them the queen-knight tactics where the strategy was to checkmate the opponent's king. That. What else? Oh, uh, let me think. So we went over the skewers and all that kind of stuff. I don't really know like what else is out there, but I have this book, and all right. So there's one other thing that I'm going to go over. Um, there's a type of chess game. There's a type of chess game. There's there's two types of chess games. And uh, let's leave that out. Let's do a knight. Let's do two knights and a bishop. I'll put the bishop here. And let's put the white king. Let's say... Three, six, nine. Oops. Here. 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 
All right. Here we have two knights and a bishop versus a king, queen, and a rook. <sighs> I'm not going to go over this because normally you would think right up straight that um, white can win because white's got the queen. So if you look at the board, the total amount of material worth is three six nine points for black and nine points for white so you've got to really wonder can black hold out this game i mean i'd be fighting for my life you know um let's move this knight over here just out of just out of put these pieces over here okay i'm going to show you a mating trick Let's say this king is here. Let's say this queen is here. Um, and that queen is there. Wait. Something like this. Wait, just a second. Am I doing this right? I don't remember this. The end position is something like, isn't it like this? So you would you would try to check me check your king like if you was doing it with a rook and a king. Um Let's say you can't get the position. Okay, now watch what's happening. Watch what happens here. Wait, is this going to work? The queen has to be... Let me, let me move these off the board. Okay, so now in this position, the only place the king can move is here. So what you do is you work the king to the back of the board using this technique right here. Check. Moves. Check. Moves. Check. Moves. Check. Moves. Notice this diagonal, this is square. There's a square, three by three square here. And you're moving the queen and the rook inside that square to force the, the king to the end of the board. That's the tactic. The strategy is using the rook and queen together to force the king into a checkmate. The tactics is how you do that, is you move that, that um, you move the queen and the rook, you know, diagonally, the queen's diagonally protecting like that. You get the king into a certain position. Maybe, yeah, maybe what it is, it's it's just a, um, maybe it starts like this. And black has got no other move. Let's say. I don't like that move. If I do it this way, the king can come up and then white can checkmate the king. If I move the queen, it may turn into a stalemate. Let me see.
that's a stalemate, okay? Because you've moved the queen into, you've used the tactic of the queen and the rook, but you did it in the wrong order. You've moved the wrong piece. You've moved the queen up. Now the king cannot go anywhere. You have to move the rook, it seems, so that the king can make a move, and then you do the check where the queen and the rook are protecting each other. Then the king goes back, and then you deliver the final checkmate. So that's a tactic and a strategy of checkmating. Um, again, doing checkmates, there's a tactic and there's a strategy for that. You need to know how to checkmate or you cannot win the game. And you don't want to get into stalemate. If you get into stalemate, it's a draw. Nobody wins. Nobody loses. That type of thing. Um, I'm just going to check something really quick here. I want to see something. Now, I realize there's, you know, I'm just starting to teach chess, and at some point I'm going to have, um, I may have some viewership and that sort of thing from um, a couple of places. I don't know yet. And, you know, there's people out there that are doing their thing with chess, and I guess it's okay. But I don't know what's going on here. Wait just a minute. I'm trying to check something out here. actually just looking for my stream. I've been streaming for an over an hour. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's there. But anyway, um, let me go back. Oh, shit. Wait. I don't want to do that, do I? I got to do this. <laughs> my bird is funny. Um... Let me, I got to move this, don't I, now, because it got moved. Um, I wish we have some people, but we don't. I mean, I'm here to talk about chess, you know. I'm not going to stay here all night if there's nobody around. But now there's a bunch. <coughs> Uh, what else there is about s tactics and strategies? See if there were questions. You know, I could answer questions for new players. Uh, what did I want to do? We went over skewers, forks, pins. Um, those are tactics. Those are ideas that you want to have in your mind to try to win a piece when you win material it helps gives you it gives you an advantage so you can win the game um most games are won by material advantage now me i actually play positional chess um i could be down a whole rook or i could decide to if i feel my I'm, my position's losing I may sacrifice everything right and left to get a position that allows a checkmate. Um, and I've done, it, I've done it a few times. It can be done. In five-minute games, 
I think it's better to try to play for material win because people are thinking tactics and they're thinking, how can I get a piece? How can I win a pawn? Is my opponent going to blunder a piece or a blunder a pawn or that kind of thing? P positional chess doesn't allow the time to say, I'm going to attack this square with the intention of putting a knight there. And if I can get a knight there, I can win the game because I know the end game rules. Um, there's that. I mean, most games are played trying to win material. When you think like a master and you play with the intent of becoming a master type player, you play positional chess with the idea that you want to take material off the board. Um, I'm going to take this, this pawn happens to be sitting on this square, or it may end up on another square, which I can eventually take. But what I'm really doing is I'm pounding pieces on a square so that I can own a square on the board, not take not just to take your piece. I don't want to just take your piece off the board. I want to put my piece on that piece on that square where your piece was. So that's like adding insult to injury. And chess players, the good chess players know this. They will capitalize on it. They will they will gather up an army of pawns and whatever to defend that square with their literal lives. And when you've got somebody that's thinking four or five, six, seven moves ahead, as well as two or three different variations, because that player is thinking, okay, if this player does this move, how can I counterattack or what am I supposed to do? Okay, so what if this player does this move? How do I counterattack? What moves do I need to make? You are doing that for the three best possible solutions to the problem. And you're doing that every time your opponent moves, more or less. It's mind-bendingly, excruciatingly painful. Um, I don't know how people can do it. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. It's too much. My idea of playing chess is to play five-minute games. Maybe meet a few people, you know. You're going to beat them. They're going to beat you. They're from different countries. Um, and trying to have fun, I guess. You want to have some element of fun and laughter and, and um, that kind of thing in, in some games that you're playing. It does, they do exist out there, but I, I'm so tired right now because I drove like four or five hours today earlier doing something. So um, I'm not teaching so you want to be a good chess player, this is how you should play. Um, I, I've, I've gone over some most of the basic tactics. Um, you develop your strategy or your plan based on whether or not you can see a tactic happening or about to happen. Or you're trying to force something and something's going to happen and now all of a sudden you have a new strategy because a piece is pinned or there's there's a skewer possibility or that type of thing. Uh, I honestly can't think of anything else. So let's go into this book called Amateur's Mind. And I don't know. There, I've got some pages marked off. I don't know what this is. Rules of Space. <coughs> So, another strategy would be rather than, okay, there's, like I was saying, there's positional chess and there's material chess. 
I could have all the materials on the board, but if I've got one move with two pieces and it checks major king, check major king, I won. That's positional chess. And the really good chess players, like me, <laughs> play positional chess. We play for owning position and not material. I don't, gi I don't give a crap about material. Um, as long as I keep as much of my material as I can... It doesn't matter if I have a better position than you do. If I can move my pieces better than you can, it doesn't matter. If you've got a queen stuck over on the side of the board and it can't do nothing, or if you have a knight on the side of the board that's not doing anything, then you may have material, but you don't have position because those pieces are not doing anything. They're not supporting anything. They're not supporting a square. They're not doing a bunch of things. When you're thinking like a grandmaster, you're looking at each piece on the board. What is that piece doing? What are the other pieces doing to complement the piece that you're thinking about? You have that situation. It's called situational awareness. And being in the military, I know all about this stuff. So then you think, okay, this is what's going on over there. Can I devise a, a strategy within the next five or six moves that puts so much pressure on my opponent that those pieces that are stuck over there on the other side of the board that are not doing anything are even going to look worse. Um, there are two main ideas. There are, there are also two other main ideas. There's positional and there's material. There's another idea in chess, and I will go over this right now if I can. Let me just fill up every, every pawn here. And let's say that white has, let's say that white has a black bishop. And what doesn't a black has a knight somewhere? Now, immediately looking at this position, bla uh, white has a good bishop. Now, there are good bishops and there are bad bishops, okay? If I put another bishop on the board for white, white has a good bishop and white has a bad bishop. Cut it out! White's bad bishop is the light-colored bishop because it can't go anywhere. But that's not the reason. White also has a dark bishop, which also can't go anywhere, or else, gonna, or else it's going to get attacked. It can't go anywhere. <sighs> However, White's dark bishop is actually the good bishop because it can attack the opponent's pawns. So that's how you delineate between the good and the bad bishops. You look at this. You look at the board, and you say, "Can my bishop at attack most of my opponent's pawns? If they can attack most of my opponent's pawns, then I have a good bishop." So you don't want to trade a good bishop for a bad bishop, okay? You want to trade your bad bishop for your opponent's good bishop. If you have two bishops of the same color on each side of the board, it's going to lead into a draw. If you have opposite colored bishops on either side of the board, it could be a win. However, the side that's in the win must have the good bishop. If the side that's has, uh, that wants to win is the bad bishop, then it could be a draw. So, now in this particular case, we have a knight on black side of the board. And not even looking at the board... Um, white's posi black's position is better because it's closed. This is a closed position. However, black has a knight. Knights work best in closed positions. If a pawn, if these pawns weren't there or something, black could get a knight here, or black could get a knight, you know, down in here, and and attack. You know, let's say that pawn was there, and white had a black had a knight here. He could take his knight, attack this pawn for free. Because let's say if the white's king was way over here 
and couldn't do anything. And this pawn attacks. This bishop goes here. That pawn goes there. This bishop goes here. Luckily, the pawn can't queen because the bishop can take it. But if there was another situation where the bishop, let's say the bishop was a light squared bishop or something, you know? Uh, the fuck is this? Then you've got, you know, you got the knight can get in behind enemy lines, whereas the bishop, you know, I suppose the bishop could do, uh, the bad bishop obviously can't get behind enemy lines, but if it was a good bishop, you know, maybe it could do the same thing that the knight can do. It could attack that pawn, and then white can advance. Um, so it seems like there's, you know, there's tactics for both sides. I just wanted to put it out there. But um, the other situation is that, let's see. Black can put a knight. It, I don't, s I'm not seeing the position that I like here. Well, let's just put it there. So let's say now, let's say that uh, white has a bad bishop, okay? Now, when you're playing as black, you your strategy is to get rid of white's good bishop. You don't want the good bishop attacking your pawns, which is the dark squared pawns. That's your strategy. You pull off tactics to get rid of that bishop. Maybe you trade it. You trade the opponent's good bishop for your knight. And then you have your opponent's bad bishop against your good knight. And then you can literally say, ha, I got a good knight, so good knight, right? So this position here allows the knight to move in such a way that it gets right here. Knights are the best pieces. Knights and bishops are the best pieces to do what's called blocking a pawn. To preventing a pawn from uh, becoming a pass pawn, which is past the fourth rank or whatever, you block it with your knight. Knights are really good at doing this. Not only that, as you can see here, it's attacking the bishop and that pawn. So, like, white's got to go here to protect that pawn. Um, I don't know, you know, what else can black do, black do here, you know? I don't know. Maybe he could move the pawn or something. But still, white can't, you know, white can't get in there. And, you know, maybe black and work back and forth and try to get a get a king in here or something. I just wanted to show you the position where the knight was guarded by these two pawns. Um, it's not a typical position, but something similar to that might be, um, let's see. Maybe something like that, or even uh, you could have a knight over here. You would not see a knight back here. That's not a good position. What you would normally see is you would see a knight being protected by a pawn. And you would not see a knight over on the side of the board. Even uh, the second rank or, or the second file over, you would not see a knight there either most of the time. Most of the time it's either in the third rank third through fifth or whatever the number is. That's a good position for a knight. That's okay. So a strategy is using a knight to block a pawn. So in this case, 
maybe uh, black didn't want the f pawn to advance, so he moved his knight here. He's prevented this pawn from causing any problems, and now black can go on about his business and do, you know, whatever. Uh, so there's so the other thing what they're talking about here on this this game uh, they're showing a position. When you have more space, it is usually a good idea to avoid exchanges. That's rule number one. Rule number two, if you have less space, an exchange or two will give the rest of your pieces more room to move about. Rule number three, a spatial plus is a permanent long-term advantage. You don't have to be in any hurry to utilize it. Take your time and let the opponent stew in his own juices. That was a rated 1700 game, man. Let me see what else I've got. Um, so that's why I marked that because that's. So we've got development and initiative. I just lost the fucking piece of paper down there. You know, uh, there's tempo, there's, you know, mo exchanging. There's exchanging pieces. So let's say if, if you have. Um, Let's say, let's say there's a bishop here, and white wants to do some stupid shit or whatever. White's bishop's a bad bishop. Well, it's a good bishop in this case. You wouldn't, you wouldn't trade, you know. Um... But every time, if you notice, every time your opponent takes a piece, what happens is, it number one, it allows you to advance and move a piece. Um, it does give you tempo, which, which basically gives you a, a, the chance to advance, uh, move a piece. You know, you've done, he's done that. You've advanced this pawn, um, or if there should happen to be another knight on the board, and white decides to use trade off a good bishop, black saying, well, sure, go ahead. Now black has his knight, his piece on a dark square, and the, the light squared bishop can never touch the the knight there because it's on a dark square. So that's a positional advantage and technically even a material advantage for black. Well, technically it's not a material advantage because both the bishop and the knight are worth the same amount of points. Personally, I like bishops better than knights. I hate knights. I just can't do anything with fucking things. Um... So yeah, there's a whole section on material. Talks about rules of space there. Rules of the center. Okay, here, this book is by international master Jeremy Silman. Now, he does say, which is kind of my thinking, bishops really are better than knights in a pawn race situation. It was demonstrated to Kaplan, and then in 1850 found out also, don't let it happen to you. Because bishops can obviously take more, you know, control of the board. <coughs> now here's another thing. You don't want to advance your pawns too early. Acquisition of the center, territory, and space. Every chess player is attracted to beautiful combinations and razor-sharp kingside tactics. This attraction makes us want to emulate the great attacking masters, and as a result, we study games by Kasparov, Alakine, and Tal. Through, though this ability to calculate is invaluable, and at least the basic understanding of the mechanics of attack is imperative, the positional elements of chess tend to be ignored by the legions of amateurs that love the game. Why? Do amateurs play, amateur players think that subjects such as territory and center b are boring? Or could it be that literature on this subject simply presents information in a dull manner? 
Whatever the reason for this relative ignorance might be, most amateurs don't have a clue about their proper use of space advantage or a full pawn center. Instead, they constantly look for forcing con uh, continuation, which, yeah, I do look for forcing, aimed at the enemy king, and once they give themselves a green light, they will start a completely unjustified attack, or even worse, just to tight and do nothing at all. Personally, I like nothing more than to create a large pawn center and squeeze my opponent to death in its space-gaining coils. After the, after the game, the poor victim often has a glazed look in his eyes. He knows he lost badly, but is not quite sure why. There are three areas of the chessboard, kingside, center, and queenside. Center is by far the most important. Unfortunately, most amateurs seem to have wing vision. Yeah, I like to do my attacks on the queen side. The following rules concerning play in the center and on the wings may prove beneficial. A full pawn center gives its own owner territory and control over key central squares. Rule number two, owning a full pawn center is a responsibility. Once you create it, you must strive to make it indestructible. You achieve this goal, then your center will cramp. If, if you achieve this goal, then your center will cramp and restrict your opponent for the rest of the game. Don't advance the center too early. Every pawn move leaves squeak where, <laughs> squeak, weak squares in its wake. Here's an example of um, a strong pawn center. So here the knight's block. Advancing the e pawn weakens both d5 and f5. Notice how the black knight cannot advance because of the white center. Even after it substitutes, the knight would still be unable to find an advanced central post. However, if white were to advance the center e4 to e5, then the d4 and d5 f5 squares are suddenly available to the tormented horse. So in other words, if this guy moves here, then the knight can either go there or over there type of thing. If your opponent has created a full pawn center, you must strive to attack it. This creates a battle of philosophies. He is telling you it is strong. You are telling him that it's a target. One of the most common cases of allowing a strong center in order to attack it comes about in the Alec Alekhine's defense. Um... Now, there's some terminology that I forgot. And I don't remember exactly what it is, okay? There's a pawn structure. And the you have three pawns. You have a, your base pawn, your support pawn, and, and your attacking pawn, whatever. The most important pawn that you would think is in this structure is the one at the bottom because it supports all the others. But that is not the case. The most important pawn is this one in the middle, right here. Um, I don't understand all the reasons behind it, but that's the pawn that you want to protect. If you got a knight down here, you can protect them, protect them both. But if you got a bishop, you know you'd want to be protecting that pawn right there. Let's see if we can do this Alekhine's uh, defense. So we got e4. And I also have some games put up over here. I don't play Alekhine's defense, by the way. Daring the pawn to advance. So this is talking about uh, your pawn center structure and that sort of thing. Hmm. 
Now we've got D4. D6. D7. C4. White grabs all the central space he can. D captures E. Now I'm running the moves from the book. I'm not looking at the moves uh, in the game on that list. Black plays knight to c6. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that scared the fuck out of me. What the fuck here? Uh, D captures e5, F captures e5. Now knight to d6. D6. Developing the hidden d4. Flat white plays bishop to e3. The immediate knight f3 would have allowed black to intensify the pressure with bishop to g4. So if I'm if I go cancel move and then I try to do Isa wait. I'm not. I'm not able to do variations here. I don't know why. This is a newer Fritz, and I haven't played with this. I want to do a variation. See, all I'm doing, I'm doing something. I'm not doing. Uh, I'm doing openings book. I'm not doing notation or something. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. What am I doing? Wait a minute. Let me back this. I don't know how to do this. I have to I have to learn. I c I don't know where to back up the game here. All I have is cancel move. Fuck it, I don't know where that is. It says if knight f3, black plays bishop to g4. I'll just go back to that was played by. So this is a. Um, Bishop at e3 is a better move. It says 70%. Like more games. 86 games versus 7 have played this other move. So there's a total of 6 games here. And I don't see white won 50% of the time. I don't know what that continuation would be. And I can't go, I'm not going into um, that aspect yet. That's more advanced. So there's bishop e3.
Black wants to play e6, but he doesn't want to block in his white squared bishop. That's this guy. He wants to play this guy, but he doesn't want to block that bishop then. Knight to c4. See how white's got the open dark bishop? It's a common move for black to play here. And then put the knight, but the pawn's advanced, so this is a bit of an issue there. Castling early in the game. Striking at e5. And forcing white to trade off his most cramping pawn. Why exactly does that force anything? If 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 white just leaves it there, then um, white's got an isolated pawn. White probably doesn't want an isolated pawn. And 29 moves, we're 29 games have played with this. And we've got bishop captures. Black's looking pretty good. Training, black training his sights on the d4 pawn. White claims this pawn is strong. Black claims that it's weak. So we're talking about, you know, all right, so here's where we get defenders and attackers. Um, so we've got, uh, what was the last move? It's white to move. <coughs> if black wanted to attack the pawn, he'd have to have like another knight on it or something. White has two pieces on the pawn. Black's got two pieces attacking. Nothing's going to happen. Now white can push the, e the D pawn and force an exchange or making the knight to move, which is moving the piece twice, which is not good for black. White plays queen to d2. Maybe putting a rook behind and threatening to advance the pawn. Preparing to bring the rook to d1 and give d4 more support. Queen to e7. Preparing to place more pressure against d4 via a rook from a to d8. Rook from a1 to d, uh, rook a1 to d1, d8. And rook from a to d8. For the center, white is doing everything he can to defend the center. Black is doing everything he can to, to attack it. If the center pawns get traded, then open files exist that make it easy to get one's rook, rooks into play. And I play, there's a variation of the carry can defense where the C pawn is exchanged, leaving black's C file open. Well, supposedly that's done early on in the game. Uh, then there's another, there's a showing another game here, E4, E6, D4, D5. E captures, E caps, blah, blah. It doesn't take a genius to see that the open E file would be a nice place to stick a rook following the rule that rooks belong on open files. Rule number six, if the center becomes locked, then the play switches to the wings. And he goes through another game here. It's easy to see that the center's a dead zone. All the play left takes place on the sides of the board. With a closed center, I guess that's the end of that. With a closed center, you know which wing to play on by noting the direction that your pawns point. The pawns point to the area where you have more space, and that is the side you want to control. Um, maybe white's pawns have more space on the queen side. And also, looking at this position, it looks like black has an isolated pawn.
In general, you want to push the pawn that stands next to your most advanced pawn. Rule number eight, a wide open center allows you to attack with pieces. A closed center generally means that you must attack with pawn. So there's some variations in there and I can't go over them because I don't know, I don't have it set up for variations. Now, if we, if we, I don't, let's see, can I cancel? I can cancel all the moves that were shown in the book. And we look and look at the opening play. So most openings are C five, or Z five, and there's some you know it goes down the list here. So we're gonna see if most openings are following this normal pattern. Now here instead of, wait, d6, here it says knight f3, most games played with knight f3 on the fourth move, shit, did I move my rules of space, I lost Rules of this. I lost where I was at. Damn it. Crap. Oh, God damn it. Hold on here. Let me put that. Okay. There's a whole uh, subject on pawn structure. My my bird agrees with me. I don't know uh, if I go left. Oh, it could be this one here. I forgot where the hell I was. I'm very tired. this way? Yeah, I think it's right here. So, most moves are played, like three times as many moves are played with knight f4, a uh, knight f3 on the fourth move. Whereas here, white plays c4, and there's no mention of knight to f3. So with the C4 line, then oh, there's a variation. I don't even know how the hell I got there.
Now that's odd because it's it's black is giving up an isolated pawn. Why would black? You see, what happens is when black pushed the f pawn, it left the e pawn weak and isolated. So whatever the tactics are there, that gets w uh, way more than involved in what I want to get into. Um, and I don't even know what re what relevance there's. Both sides have pretty much equal amount of space. So that just goes into the center. I mean, this book, this book right here, The Amateur's Mind, is about <laughs> almost two inches thick. And it goes into a lot of other things. It talks about, um, you know, material advantage. It talks about position. It talks about your pawn structure. Um, battle between bishop and knight. There's a game. So what happens in this book is uh, he's talking, he's teaching, he's trying to get players that are low rated to, like this is a, a thousand rated player, and he's talking about moves. Uh, he's trying to get the, the 1,000 rated player to talk about his moves. Here it talks about due to state imbalances, White will use the Steinitz rule to make knights ineffective by taking away their advanced support point. You know, stuff like that. That's very advanced. Shut up! Okay. No. All right. Somebody wants to get a little bath time, don't they? Where are you? Told you, I said no. Um, what else is in this book? Looks like something more I can go over. Development and initiative. I wonder if there's something in there. Development. Rule number one. A lead in development usually means that you must start some sort of aggressive act. Quiet play puts no pressure on the opponent and will allow him to get the rest of his forces out. A lead in development means the most open positions because their open central file should enable your army to penetrate into the hostile position with relative ease. If you have more pieces out and the position is wide open or even partly open, then don't hesitate to attack. I don't play this as solely in defense. But we will just, let's see. Wait a minute, let me, how many, where's C5? So most of the openings are C5. <laughs> I don't play it because there's way too many variations and 
trust me. You don't want to. You don't even want to go there, really. Don't don't run the Sicilian. That's just very. It's not good for your health. Bishop f5 check. Now you can see there, d4 is a more popular. But we're going to go by the numbers that are in the book here. The line remains popular at all levels of competition. Yeah, I'm sure. <coughs> now we've got bd7. Bishop captures. Queen captures. Now we've got c4. Black can win a pawn with the greedy but overly risky queen to g4. Someone actually played queen to g4 here. However, this move, which does give black static material edge, allows white to build up an enormous advantage in development. We'll see if the book matches this game. So white castles... Queen captures e4 and d4. This might even be the same game for all we know. White opens up as many lines as possible. These open files should be looked upon as highways into the hostile position. So you got you got diagonals, you know, you got the, the rook could come out here and attack the queen. I mean really, you know, white can put pressure and the queen is out there in the open. That's another rule. I never play that queen early in the game, even if it leads to... Now, here we're talking, okay, so black's got a pawn. He's a pawn up. But black's position is such that black has a queen out in the middle of the board, and that thing's going to get harassed right and left. Now here, queen c6 was played. Then we've got knight captures d4. Queen captures c4 is a questionable move. Uh, white to play and attack like mad. So... What could white do here? Black's last two moves gave him a two-pawn advantage. However, few things in life are free, and the suicidal capture gives white more development and more open lines. If you are the defender in such positions, remember that it is really a good idea to open lines if you if your king the king is still in the center. White plays knight to a3, which looks like it's even this game or something. From this point on, White will play with threats and never allow his opponent to bring his lazy troops out. Queen to c8. Looks like it's the same games here. Knight from a to b5. There's a line there, but it stops here. Let me see. Knight from A to B5. Threatening knight captures D6. Because the pawn is prote protecting that is pinned. So we were talking about those pins earlier. So is that really defended? The answer is no, it's not, because it can't move. If the king could move out of the way, then it would be defended, but I don't think it's a good idea. 
So now you can see, look at all the open space here that white has. Black is totally constricted here. This is just, this is madness. Black plays queen to d7. White answers the obvious e6 with knight to f5. How is how is e6 knight to f5? Oh, because that pawn is still pinned. So now white has three pieces on that. The engine's suggesting queen to d7. That's one of my favorite moves. Renewing the threat against d6. Now, bishop captures. It's time to crack open the Black King. White is playing for complete Armageddon, and as a result, normal material and positional considerations not, no longer exist. Rook captures. Rook to d5. That's odd. So why can't black just take the rook? Oh, because that would be a royal fork. So I was, I read where people are saying the royal fork is a check between the king and the, and the queen. But I disagree with that. A royal fork, and I actually had this in one of my games, is a check with the king, queen, and rook. So if the queen, black queen, takes the rook, the knight can come down, this white knight can come down and check both the king, the queen, and the rook. That's a royal fork. Oh, fuck, what, just, what did I just do? There's a moot. Uh, all right, so black is not given a moment's rest. Queen goes to c8. Taking on d5 was not possible due to knight c7 check. Yeah, we saw that. Knight to f5. Another fork is threatened on d6. Captures e7. King captures e7. Mate follows. If knight captures on e7, there's a checkmate. Because now you're looking at the square d8. d8 is attacked two times. 
and it's only defended once. So if knight captures, that's check there. Let's d8 check. I know, I guess there's a knight in there somewhere. So after king captures, then you've got rook to e5 check. 1 0. Black has taken enough punishment. King to f8, queen to b6 check does not paint a pretty picture for the second player. Queen to d6. Oh, here. Knight to e7. Queen captures e7 check. King to g8. That's forced, isn't it? Yeah, it's forced knight. Queen captures. He captures. Mate. Holy shit, the fuck just scared the shit out of me. If the enemy king is still in the center and you have a lead in development, consider these factors an invitation to rip the opponent's head off. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? Bloodlust in this game? I'm telling you. Start an immediate attack. At the very least, you will keep his king stuck in the middle and make him suffer for a long time to come. Rule number four, a closed position often nullifies a lead in development because of blocked files used. That's probably another game of some sort. A common, a common opening at least to a closed center. Uh, another, it looks like another Sicilian line of some sort. I don't know what that was. Was that a Sicilian? It probably was. So now we've got d4, knight f6, c4, c5. So this is like a transposition, transpositional Sicilian defense type of thing, maybe. I don't know. No, see, this is leading towards a, f well, no, the French. Yeah, it's leading towards a French. D5, E5, Knight to 5. What? That's what it says. So in that position, D Black's D6 pawn's weak. So White already has a plan now. Attack that backward pawn. Bishop to e7. This line is known as the check Benoni. Bishop d3. That's horrible for white. Look at that bishop just sitting out there. Black castles. King to g8. Black allows himself to fall behind development because he knows that white's pieces cannot get to him due to the traffic jam in the middle. After eight white castles, black shows that he's willing to lose even more time by bishop to g5, trading off his bad bishop for white's good one. So this is what the book says. So let's see what happens here. So white castles, black plays bishop to g5, Now, remember we were talking about terminologies of bishops, okay? I'm not looking at the book right now. White's good bishop is the dark one. 
black's good bishop is the white one. Now, what does it say here? Black shows he's going to lose even more time. Trading off his bad bishop. For white's good one. Now, this is incorrect. This is totally incorrect. And this is in a book by an international master, okay? I'm not saying that the guy is lying, okay? Where is the bishop trade? I don't even see where the... Where the oh, wait, did I make a wrong move? Black shows... Disdain for development instead of calm, which is a good stretch, good stage goal... Secure and knowledge that he can catch up in development. So here's here's Jeremy Silman, international master, saying that black moved G bishop to g5, which is what I did. Wait, that's bishop to g4. We want bishop to g5. Here. Oh, I moved the light squared bishop. Aha. Aha. Okay, now see, I, I, I made a mistake. So that's why I was questioning it. Now, all right, we, now we do have the correct bishop to g5. Okay, so now the bishop is attacking. All right, it says black trading off his bad bishop for white's good one. So white's good bishop, which is this dark one, is definitely white's good bishop because it's attacking the dark squared pawns. So that's the point that I wanted to make, and it's right even right here in this book. So um, there you go. So they're talking about... Close center development, you know, try to develop your pieces. Why they talk about these openings. And I'm really, I'll show you, I'll show you a game that I typically play. But I got to reverse the board somehow. <coughs> board. Flip. All right. Here's a game that, here's a game, well, I don't, we play d4, I'll show you this, we got this, we got c6, well, I want to play c6, I want to play, e6 is played a lot, now what about knight, c6. I don't fucking know. Now, normally I play this bishop here. C5 is questionable. Knight of six. Okay. <coughs> Now I'm there's knight. I'm gonna show you. Let's say if black, for example, let's say if black. Oh, uh, I don't really know what he's gonna do, but let's say if I play here, black tries to fee and shadow this bishop. When black plays this move, okay, I have read where the masters are saying the best move is for white to play bishop to e2 not to play bishop to d3. And also look at the look at black's pawn structure here. Black has all the pawns on the light colored squares. So what this means is that this bishop that I have out here, this dark squared bishop, this needs to be traded for maybe the dark squared bishop. Okay, so whose move is it here? So I could actually even go here. I don't really want a castle, but we'll just do it anyway. 
I wanted to show you something. I'm just making really weird moves here. See that it's everything's con deconstructed here. But what I wanted to show you is like you know, white is advancing. This is my favorite game. It's not my typical game because I don't quite play like this, but it's very close. And the idea is that I'm playing on the queens. I'm playing with the idea of castling on the king side and making a queen side attack. Most of the higher rated players will play instead something like uh, they'll move the knight back, um, you know, maybe even trade this. Holy fucking shit, that scared the fuck out of me. What the hell did I fucking do? Well, there's that, which I didn't see, but that ain't going to do anything else. Is that... Yeah, there's F4. So, white could could attempt to do a kingside pawn storm. And the knight is not on the particular guarding square, which is three squares out right there on that space. And because of the fianchetto bishop, there's this attack line. The idea, the idea is, I don't know, I'm just going to make stupid ass fucking moves. The idea is to play that H pawn you know, I would just say black is really stupid. And then makes th this capture. What the fuck? Oh, here we go. So you got this. And then say... You got that. And you got maybe this. And say you got that. White's trying, black's trying to do some stupid shit. I mean, you can, you get the idea. Like, the rook is on the open file. The, the bishop's gonna come back. You know, maybe is it white's move? <coughs> yeah, fuck them. Now I've seen games where the rook will sack. That takes. Then you've got a queen here. Could block. Most of the time it just goes back in a corner. But I don't know what that, I don't know what the attack is. I have no idea what the strategy is getting into that fianchetto bishop area. But I was just showing the idea of attacking on the queen side. Um, there are other games, there's, um, I play what's called London System. It's so easy to learn, and the Catalan, I think it is, or something, I don't fucking know. So this is the London, maybe something like that, something like that. Knight comes out. I always play the H pawn because I don't want to lose my bishop. Now see, the bishop is left behind because you don't know if black wants to fianchetto his bishop. So this knight comes out. Let's see this. So now we know what's happening. Um... I've always wanted to play this knight over to this square. We don't we still don't know yet what's happening here. Let's see if we get a fianchetto bishop. Then we know this knight's gonna come out to here. Oh, what the fuck? Wait a minute.
I don't know if White's plans are in chat. But White's plan is gonna wants to be to open up the side of the board. Cause see how I got the white bishops hanging out over here. You've got all this open space. Push th push these pawns. Move the queen up here. Maybe move the queen behind the pawns. Get the rooks lined up on that outside file. There's a bunch of stuff going on that's easy, you know, easy to figure out. That's the basics of tactics and thinking like a master, talking about strategy. Um, a basic idea of closed and open positions, not really the best. Understanding your bad bishop and your good bishop, that th that's the, one of the most important things. Knowing that knights are good in closed positions, uh, bishops are good in open positions. So if you get a whole bunch of pawns on the board, keep your knights. If all the pawns are disappearing off the board, keep your bishops, that sort of thing. I try to play, if you look at this position here, most of my pawns are on dark colored squares. So I purposely keep my light squared bishop behind and, I'm, and my dark squared bishop is out here ready to trade and so on and so forth. That's the whole reason for my play is because I'm already thinking end game. And um, it's so easy to learn. It's, it's like right there. And now all I got to do is just learn variations as to what's happening so that I can get rid of this dark bishop, open up a line somewhere where I can get the light bishop attacking those light colored pawns. You know, like moving in advance. Like I'd be doing this kind of shit, man. You know? Now, what if black was to take, right? My best move here might be... Now, I've got... See, I've got a reposition check. I can't really go there because I'd be attacked by the knight. Um, I could go here. Now, what the fuck? Black could attempt to go here, and if I take, and then this guy comes down, I think that's better for white. Because then now, see, I can move that knight back here and reattack this pawn, but then this guy can come up here, which is still in my favor, because you can see they're all on light-colored squares, and I'm using my bishop to actually block, uh, so I could actually play here. Now knights, white's knight is out of position there. The black bishop, you know, black's pieces are constricted here. I've got open space over here. Now another thing is like say this knight wants to go to that square and this knight's on a three by three square and I, it's going to take me half a dozen moves to, to try to protect that square. I could probably push a3. The other thing is you want to keep your pawns as close to home as possible. If you outstretch your pawns too much, it's going to be a problem. Um, I don't know what else to do here. But I'm definitely tired. But I think I went over a lot of good stuff. Um, I think... It's, I think the most important thing in learning how to play is get a basic idea of your openings. Um, like I said, I was just playing that London system there. Know your openings. Know why you're playing your openings, okay? If you play an opening like this, and black just does stupid shit, right? All the beginners play this opening. And the really noobs players, they don't see it. You know, they'll try to open up the outside pawns and bring their rooks out early. And the next thing you know, bam, there's a checkmate here. Another really cool mate is if black decides to play, let's say, this pawn. Oh, my fucking God. Uh, white plays the king pawn. And then black plays, let's say, that pawn. 
No, there's a better move. Mate right there. Mate. That's a cool mate right there. I've actually played that in the game. And then with the bishop, there's... Uh... Shit. There's this. this and there's also instead of playing the queen to f which is actually a better move uh, p new players will play the queen all the way out to here making it even more and what's another thing that's interesting is that moving this knight right here doesn't stop the mate mate that's that's called the scholar's mate i think but anyway um, I don't play, this is an e-pawn opening. When you play the king pawn, the pawn that's in front of the king, it's an e-pawn opening and black plays c5 and fucking Sicilian dragon and all that other happy horse shit. I play d4, and that's usually d4. I play the bishop out like I was showing you earlier, you know? And there's some other things, there's some other stuff you can do. You know, you can keep, doing this um you know i don't know why that pawn's sitting there it's just crazy shit but you can see all my dark pawns you know it's pretty obvious that i've got a bad bishop here maybe i should learn my opening such that i don't leave that bad bishop looking so bad at the beginning Oh, I can't think. What else is there? Um, there's, there's, it's more like you gotta learn your pawn structure. You gotta learn uh, how to mate your king. You gotta learn your skewers, your 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 forks. And now it's like you know you gotta do all this within the space of five or ten minutes, and you're playing against time and everything. Um, a real chess game is played over the board. It's not played on a computer. And it takes hours. A 90-minute game is like fucking... Well, it's 45 minutes aside or something. I mean, an hour and a half sitting there staring at a chessboard. Or now just streaming here for three hours looking at the screen. Um, these are reasons why I suggest you not to learn this game. Just forget playing chess. Now with COVID and everything, everything's gone to computer. It's going to be so much worse. Um, Magnus Carlsen was playing a game just recently, and he moved his queen, and he had a mouse slip, and he lost his queen and lost a major game. And we're talking some some money, you know, literally could be a thousand thousands of dollars in the game. And it's all because of a mouse slip on a computer. I mean, you know, so... There's other video games out there, and there's other games, there's other things in life to do. I cannot openly suggest playing chess, but there are people that like to play it. I am willing to be here for those people that are interested in learning the aspects of what it takes to become a master in chess. I am more instructing on you should learn how to play chess from a level of you're going to lose, okay? Uh, you can do tons and tons of puzzles. You can do three-minute games. You can do bullet, lightning, all the fast games. The five-minute games, five and zero, are the best games to play to learn your opening. Get your idea for how you want to learn your openings. If you want to learn Sicilian and dozens and dozens of variations of how to play it, including some of the transpositions in there, by all means, that's your bag. You know, I, I don't teach that. I teach uh, systems for beginner to intermediate players and um, 
I, I may go into those openings and study those variations. Um, outside of that, there's reasons for the variations. So then I would go into um, how to play bishop and uh, bishop end games, bishop versus knight or bishop versus bishop. Same colored bishop, opposite colored bishop. There's, there's, uh, those are end games and you need to know those. I need to know those if I want to continue and win my opening. This is my opening. This is my baby. So in order for my baby to work, I need to know the end game and what is it that I'm trying to do. I am trying to pass a pawn to make a queen and win the game that way. I'm not looking for the checkmate up front. Grandmasters, when they play, they don't look for checkmates. They look for how to win a pawn and how to pass that that pawn, how to get that pawn that they've won and, and it converted into a queen. That is thinking like a serious grandmaster and playing chess over the board for hours on end and learning patterns and variations to make that goal come true. Um, I have got a lot of reading material. I've got a Fritz database, uh, as you can see, I've been working here. I've got some information somewhere. I don't know where it is. I'm hoping I can find it and uh, talk about my opening play and that sort of thing. Outside of that, I think I'm done for the night.